my name is Brendan Kelly. I practice up the road uh, in Burlington. I practice, um, as Sri mentioned, Chinese medicine. I practice acupuncture and Western herbal medicine, Western and Chinese herbal medicine. And it's really uh, very heartwarming for me to... What's that? L louder? Yeah, here's the mic further up, so it's okay. closer to your... There we go. I'm going to angle it that way. Let's see if that helps. How's that? Better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's very heartening to be here today because um, a major part of our practice clinically is nutrition. And I know this is uh, obvious, self-evident to everyone here today, but of course what we eat affects fundamentally who we are. And it affects fundamentally our health and our sickness. And to provide a little bit of a context, um, in Chinese medicine there's five branches of Chinese medicine. And those branches come from the same roots. And those five branches are acupuncture, which is the insertion of little needles, uh, herbal medicine, massage, uh, internal practices like Tai Chi, Qigong, and meditation, as well as nutrition. So nutrition has been quite literally a part of Chinese medicine for 5,000 years. Um, so it's very heartening for me to be here because a lot of what's being spoken about is really similar to what Chinese medicine has been saying for 5,000 years. Um, so that's very nice to hear. It's nice when old ideas become new again. Um, and uh, it's also very heartening because a lot of the principles of what's being discussed this week under the same principles in Chinese medicine. The idea of eating real food. Like, what an idea, right? Like, eat real food. Like, meat and vegetables and healthy stuff. And I've said hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times to people that I've worked with clinically, because we treat a wide range of people, in our clinic, um, to eat food that your grandparents or your great-grandparents would know to be food. Right? So if you have food in front of you and your grandparents or your great-grandparents would have no idea what that is, not so good. Right? If, it's, if it's dyed bright blue and it has a list of ingredients that you need a PhD in chemistry to understand, not so good. You know, simple, natural stuff. And the thinking about that in Chinese medicine is that the more processed food becomes, the farther and farther we're getting away from its energy or its life force. The Chinese term for that is nutrition. And, uh, excuse me, it's qi. Nutrition qi. The qi of the food that we eat. So um, I think that's very compatible with what's um, being spoken about and discussed this weekend. Um, and I, I, the talk that I like to give for the rest of the time we have together is about the idea of symptoms. What are symptoms? And I think it's a very important question because how we answer that question really speaks to how we approach medicine as practitioners as well as how we receive medicine as clients or as patients. Um, a very common view, I would say the predominant view in the West now is to approach symptoms as bad things, right? Or even kind of taking that idea down the path a little bit to um, approach symptoms as the enemy. And we can see this, as I'm inclined to do, to look at things like the um, cultural understandings of things and, and linguistics, et cetera. Um, if we look at the language that is used in our culture and in our country about symptoms, we really can understand our approach. Maybe not for some of us here or most of us here, but generally speaking, I think there's a clear pattern. Um, and the clear pattern is to approach many symptoms, especially serious symptoms, as the enemy. So let's look at some of the language that is used. We talk about the war on cancer. It's not a West, that's not a Chinese medical view. That's a Western medical view. So the war on cancer, the war on obesity, the war on diabetes, the war on drugs, right? That is a particular medical perspective. There's nothing value neutral about that. There's nothing inherently uh, medicinal about waging war on symptoms. That comes from a particular point of view. And I think that that's significant because with any war, whether it's a war in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Vietnam, or the war on symptoms, there is inevitably collateral damage. Collateral damage is unintended consequences of war, or at least consequences that aren't spoken about too much. So just as there's collateral damage in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's collateral damage when we wage war on symptoms. And we see this every day in our clinic. Um, with cancer, for example, um, and I'm going to present two case studies. One is a short one about treating a young girl who um, had pneumonia and, and her Western 
practitioners and her, her parents were concerned that she wasn't going to live, but she's doing very well now. Um, and then a longer um, case study about treating um, cancer. And just to clarify, don't treat cancer because cancer is the Western diagnosis, and I'm a uh, Chinese practitioner. But Chinese medicine is certainly capable of treating where cancer is coming from. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that. The second case study will be treating a man who was um, a little bit um, just before being diagnosed from a Western view with leukemia. And very quickly, he, within two months, he had a full recovery from that. So with treating cancer, for example, the collateral damage are things like our digestive system. There are things like our ability to absorb nutrients, things like our energy, and in severe cases, even our desire to live, our will to live. So rather than being a surprise, in my opinion, when we approach medicine as medical warfare, there will inevitably be collateral damage, right? And I, I think that's important because that's not inevitable. You don't have to treat significant symptoms, whatever kind of significant symptoms they are, physically, mentally, emotionally, as warfare. In fact, my uh, proposal is that we actually wage peace. And one of the ways we can wage peace, of course, is through nutrition. Um, it's a way we feed ourselves mentally, physically, mentally, and emotionally, and even spiritually. So um, I think how we approach medicine is very, very important because it speaks to um, not only our medical view, but really our cultural view. And I think, uh, unfortunately, our culture and our country is very um, comfortable with warfare. You know, it's very commonplace. I mean, think about it. Think about the idea of waging war on diabetes, waging war on obesity, waging war on drugs. Who, who or what are we waging war on? The people who have those conditions, right? That condition is not separate from that person. It's not as if diabetes is over here and the person is here, right? Or cancer is over here and the person is here. People, people that we know, people in our community, our family and friends have cancer and diabetes and obesity. So what we're waging war on, in my opinion, is the people's internal fortitude. Or put simply, we're waging war on the people who have those conditions. So I don't think that that works so well um, in the long term or even in the short term. So my uh, proposition is to wage peace, um, and I, th I believe, and I certainly have a lot of clinical experience, to indicate that it's very possible to wage peace and still treat very significant conditions. I think one reason that we use a term, for example, like waging war on cancer is because it, it indicates the severity of the condition. Right? It indicates that we really want to help these people. We want to help these people get rid of a potentially life-threatening um, condition. So I think some of it is well-intended. Right? We're saying, this is significant. I want to help this person or this, these groups of people deal with cancer. Um, so I do think some of it is well-intended. <clears throat> but I think some of it is just that that's what we're comfortable with. That when we have a significant condition, we um, kind of easily fall into the idea of, of waging war. So Chinese medicine historically really specifically talks about waging peace. Um, peace within ourselves, peace with our diet, peace with the food that we eat, pe peace in our body, mind, and spirit, peace in our family, peace in our community. It's really a, a different view. And um, as I, I'm sure many of us can appreciate um, the importance of this, uh, Chinese medicine is also literally, historically, a medicine based on nature, literally. It, Chinese medicine evolved from an agricultural uh, culture. It evolved from a people who were growing veggies and raising animals and living close to the land. That's very important because the language that's used in Chinese medicine comes from nature. Major language that's used diagnostically in terms of treatment are the effects of the seasons and the effects of weather. So in Chinese medicine, we talk about things that are hot and cold and damp and dry. We talk about the influences of summer and winter and fall um, and spring. It's quite literally a medicine that comes from nature. So for me, that's very heartening. It's very encouraging. For those of us who are interested in living a good life and in eating natural food, Chinese medicine for thousands of years has been speaking our language, literally. Literally, if we're interested in good food and eating local and not having processed stuff and living uh, a sustainable life, Chinese medicine is too. You know, for thousands of years, Chinese medicine has been interested in these things. And uh, just to kind of give a little perspective about 
my practice, my wife and I uh, practice together up in Burlington. Um, you know, our, we are a family practice. We treat um, a wide range of folks from very young kids. As I'm treating a girl now who's a young girl now who's about one years old, and I'm treating some folks who are in their uh, late 80s and 90s, and so we treat that wide spectrum of folks. And maybe I should speak up a little this way. Um, and we also treat a wide range of conditions, so physically, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually. So one common question we get is, well, what, you know, what does acupuncture and herbs treat? Well, acupuncture and herbs are uh, part of Chinese medicine, or to say Eastern medicine. Well, Eastern medicine treats everything that Western medicine treats. Well, what does that include? Well, pretty much everything, physically, mentally, emotionally. One of the few exceptions would be if you get into a traumatic uh, accident, you fall off your roof or get into a car crash, I wouldn't go to the, your local herbalist. I would go to the, you know, the ER. But before and after that, for most everything else, Chinese medicine is um, absolutely uh, capable of treating. So um, a first analogy that I wanted to use, just to give some examples about what I'm talking about, is a young girl that I was um, talking about earlier. Very, very sweet. She came in and she was about 10 months old, and um, her um, mom um, and her family ate natural foods. They were farmers. They had never given her um, um, really most any natural st unnatural stuff at all, including pharmaceuticals. Um, but she had a very severe respiratory infection, and her mom tried kind of home herb remedies, and those weren't working, and then they went to another Western herbalist, and those remedies weren't able to help. Um, and then she came to us, and she had had pneumonia two times, and she was really very frail. You know, you could see, I could see the energy was very good within her, but her vitality, her life force wasn't very, her chi was not very strong. So uh, her mom came in and, was, and she brought in her, her mother, so the grandmother of the young girl, and they were really trying to convey to me that they were really, and the Western folks were also really concerned that she might not make it. And um, so part of the remedy in Chinese medicine, of course, is to, even with serious infections, she'd had pneumonia twice and respiratory issues and phlegm in the lungs and um, constantly um, having phlegm in her respiratory system, um, if you, obviously, if you can't breathe, life is not very good. So um, in, took, in looking at the difference between a medical perspective that wages peace as one in, in relationship to one that wages war, a part of Chinese medicine, which very much, I believe, speaks to what this weekend is about, is promoting well-being. Right? So uh, I didn't do acupuncture. We, don't do, we usually don't do acupuncture on young kids. We just got her a very simple Western herb formula in a tincture. And part of it was to clear out the phlegm. Well, part of it was, from the Western view, to clear out the bacterial infection. And as a result of that, there was phlegm and mucus in the respiratory system. But another big part of it, from the beginning, was to promote vitality. So in looking at an approach that emphasizes peace as opposed to war, when you're waging war, that doesn't necessarily lend itself very well to promoting vitality. Right? You're just trying to kill things. Right? You're trying to kill viruses kill bacteria, for example. And that doesn't imply that viruses and bacteria can't cause serious problems, because they can. But part of sickness, especially significant sickness, almost always includes being tired, being worn down, a lack of vitality, a lack of digestive strength, right? A lack of respiratory strength. So from the beginning, um, I got her some simple herbs, simple herb formula that was clearing out the bacterial infection. Um, and also bringing in strength. And um, very sweet young girl, but you could see that her energy, she was not like uh, a usual 10-month-old. She wasn't very um, active in the treatment room. She just sat on her mom, mom's lap, wasn't doing very much. Um, so after two weeks, she was noticeably better, a whole lot better. Um, her energy had returned, um, so much so that this uh, mom had a lot of young kids at the time, and she really, in many ways, appreciated her daughter because her daughter was essentially very lethargic. <laughs> she would just sit on mom's lap, and you know, she could put her in a chair and come back you know, 10 minutes later, and she was still in the chair. Well, after two weeks on the herbs, not so much. You, know, you could see it as soon as before in the first appointment. She just sat on her mom's lap. I talked to her, talked to mom, talked to grandma, took her pulse, looked at her tongue, and she just sat there. Two weeks later, mm -mm, no. She was crawling on the floor. We have a box of toys because in, in the clinic because we treat a lot of kids. She was playing with the toys. She wanted to get up on the treatment table. She wanted to pull down the plant in the, in the treatment room. So that was fine with me. You know, mom's like, oh, God, you know, 
I have another one like this, right? I have the fifth or sixth kid like this. Um, so mom was, you know, mom wasn't really concerned, but it was just another young kid that she had to deal with. So that was two weeks, and then another month later, just uh, decreasing the, um, the need to clear out bacterial infection, increasing energy. She's much better. And now about two and a half, three months later, she's great. Her appetite is back. Just in three months, she's grown a lot. She came in um, a little while ago, and it looks like she had just been stretched out. I mean, she's like, whoa, like the same little kid, but she, um, she wasn't growing. You know, she, from a Western view, was failure to thrive, right? Failure to grow. She had a low appetite. She wasn't growing very much. She wasn't really developing cognitively. Um, and in three months, she had changed very, very significantly, right? And part of that, I believe, is the approach of waging, waging peace, promoting strength and well-being as you um, clear things out of the body. And I, I'd like to um, kind of use um, some linguistic understanding or looking at words to talk about a difference between waging peace and waging war, right? So if anyone's a Western practitioner here, I'm not speaking badly of Western medicine. I'm just trying to differentiate between the approaches. Um, waging peace and waging war, antibiotics, anti is against. Right? Clearly, the term anti is against whatever context you use it in. Biotic comes from the term bios. Bios is life. So what are antibiotics? The term says, if we take it literally, anti-life. That's interesting. That's an interesting medical view. Um, now, one, of course, one you know, statement would be, well, sometimes there are very severe conditions where we need to use antibiotics. Well, that's one view. That's one view. I respect that view. I have not found very many conditions at all that could not be treated with acupuncture or herbs. So we've treated very significant conditions. Treated staph and strep and um, gangrene and all kinds of infections, respiratory infections, skin infections, blood infections, bone infections, all kinds of things um, can be treated um, with Chinese medicine, with acupuncture and herbs. So if you're using antibiotics, that's fine. If you know people using antibiotics, that's fine. But I do think it's interesting to kind of break down the term antibiotics and what that means and what that implies, because I, I do believe absolutely that there is collateral damage with antibiotics. Um, actually, I know there, there's collateral damage, and in particular, and sometimes the collateral damage is no big deal, people get over it, but in particular, <coughs> excuse me, to use Chinese medical thinking to talk about antibiotics, antibiotics are very, very cold. And so the way that antibiotics treat infection, because infection is inflammation, and we can look at inflammation in Chinese medicine in terms of heat. So with too much heat, the antibiotics are very cold, and they try to put the heat out. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. But part of what antibiotics put out is the digestive strength in the stomach, in particular. That's part of the results of antibiotics, invariably. Now, some people's digestive system is strong, and they can bounce back, and sometimes it's not. But the reason that people have digestive issues or elimination issues, issues with the intestines with antibiotics, is because it's putting out the energy in the digestive system. So an analogy in Chinese medicine is that the stomach is a cook stove. So it needs to have warmth. You don't want too much warmth, but you certainly don't want too little warmth. So um, antibiotics in particular can affect the digestive system. So this little girl is doing great. It's very sweet. Looks like she's been literally stretched out. She hasn't gained much weight yet, but I don't know how many inches she's grown in three months. A lot, a lot. And she's doing better. Um, she's you know, clearly developing really quickly cognitively. She's starting to talk more and crawl around. So that's one um, small example of um, you know, an approach that is clearing things out as well as promoting well-being. And um, the next, next um, a uh, case study I'm going to talk about is going to talk much more about nutrition. This young girl really didn't need any nutrition recommendations. Um, her family are organic farmers. the really good food, so there wasn't much to talk about with that. It was really just um, getting rid of what was causing the problems. So um, another case study that I want to talk about is um, a really nice experience that we had in our clinic treating a man um, when we were in Montana, we had a clinic in Montana for six years before we moved back to Vermont. We've been back in Vermont for three years, and we had another clinic in southern Vermont for three years. Um, 
No one in their right mind would do that, uh, set up clinics all the time <laughs> from scratch. We did that because of family stuff, so we've gotten lots of experience treating people in different places around the country. I don't recommend that as a business strategy. But <laughs> <laughs> or a life strategy, really, um, though we've gotten good at it. Um, so the next case study was a man who was a rancher in Montana, and he had been seeing us for um, seeing me for on and off for maybe about um, a year and a half, intermittent acupuncture and intermittent herbs. And um, he came to see us the, again, he hadn't seen us in a while, um, because his Western physician, his, his GP, his general practitioner, had recommended a series of blood tests based on some mild to moderate symptoms that he had. And those symptoms were a significant loss of energy. He was a, a rancher in his late 40s, lived in a small rural community in Montana. And he had a significant loss of energy for about two or three years. Um, he had very significant night sweats. Um, he had actually um, gained weight, a lot of weight, 30 pounds or so. Um, and he also had nodules on the back of his neck. Nodules just um, below the skin, uh, kind of like lymphatic swelling, essentially. So um, as, as a result of those symptoms, the doctor ordered another round of blood tests. And, and this patient had had blood tests um, five years before for similar um, condition, for similar symptoms. So the blood test five years before, and these, um, in the, in the, in the sake of, uh, for the sake of confidentiality, this is not an exact case study. It's a general case study. So the numbers are a little bit different. Um, but the ratios are all the same. So the numbers are a little different, but it tells the basic, same basic story. So um, five years before, his white blood cell count had been 20,000. And five years later, they were just under 20,000. They were about 38,000. So with all of those symptoms, um, the night sweats, the tiredness, gaining weight, nodules in the back of the neck, just not feeling well, um, in five years, approximately five years, if your white blood cell count doubles, that's an indication of leukemia. In particular, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. There's other kinds of leukemia. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a slow progressing one. So five years before, white blood cell count of 20,000, five years later, um, 38,000. So just short of um, having a specific numbers as specific markers that Western medicine needs to indicate CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So the GP said, well, um, because it's not quite doubled yet, um, our recommendation is just to wait three or four months. It's very possible, in fact, likely you'll get to 40,000, and then we'll prescribe chemotherapy. That's interesting. That's an interesting response. But it's, it's <laughs> for obvious reasons. But um, in one view, it's not that interesting because we have a medical system that waits for us to get sick before we receive treatments. That's what we're paying for. That's what our quote unquote healthcare system is about. It's not caring for health. We do not have a healthcare system. We have a sickness treatment system, or more accurately, we have a sickness suppression symptom system. We don't have a healthcare system. I think a healthcare system is a great idea, but we don't have that. We have a system that waits for us to get sick. So I'm not criticizing this GP because that's what he knows. That's the training. You know, that's the orientation is at 20,000, it's got to be 40,000 before you get treatment, so let's wait for it to go another 2,000, and then you get to 40, and then we'll treat you. Right? So he wasn't so groovy on that. He didn't really like that option. And one of the reasons he didn't like that option is because chronic lymphocytic leukemia, if you look at the clustering of where it occurs, it occurs in, in many cases concentrated in rural agricultural communities. <coughs> Um, and he lived in a rural agricultural community, so there was a lot of people in his community who had various forms of cancer, including leukemia, and they had received the Western treatments, and they had a very hard time. You know, again, the collateral damage, loss of appetite, loss of hair, uh, loss of weight, loss of energy, loss of will in some cases to live. So he wanted to try something else. So he came in to see us, and I said, I really think we can be of help. Uh, but I said, as I say to many people, uh, Chinese medicine is participatory. 
right? We, we have to collaborate. It's not like you just come in and you get herbs and acupuncture and you go back to what you're doing. As we all know, at this conference, one of the major things that promotes health is diet. So we came up with a plan. We had to um, understand what was causing the symptoms because Chinese medicine, the analogy is the branches are up here. The branches are the symptoms, but below the branches are the roots. And the roots are the causes of symptoms. So whatever the symptom is, it can be cancer, it can be pneumonia, it can be psycho-emotional conditions, really anything that's going on up here. If we understand where it's coming from, we can treat it. So in my experience um, doing advanced training, Chinese medical training in treating cancer and treating a number of people with cancer, the clear connection with all the different kinds of cancers that we've worked with is heat, is inflammation. And why is that? How do we translate that into a Western perspective? Well, cancer is the overgrowth of unhealthy cells. Now, there's many different kinds of cancer. There's breast cancer, leukemia, skin cancer, right? But, so they show up in, in different ways on the surface, but the root cause, I believe, is the same, which is heat, which is inflammation. So we needed to clear out that inflammation. So we needed to get him to not introduce things that were creating inflammation. So um, one of the major things that creates inflammation from the Chinese view that creates heat is sugar. So we had this, I said, no sugar. And he said, well, can I have a little sugar? I said, no, you can't. <laughs> and I, I wasn't trying to you know, dictate his life. I said, if, you're gonna, if we're going to work together, we have to work together. If I'm going to be trying to pull out heat, um, you can't be introducing heat. So he was a farmer in you know, rural Montana, which a lot of guys in rural Montana drink a lot of sugary things. So um, he cut out all sugars completely, all processed sugars, all soda. He was really into sweet tea. And I said, no sweet tea. You can do tea, but no sweet tea. But he didn't like it very much without the sweet, so he just cut that out. Um, but he, he also had to um, reduce the other lifestyle issues that were creating heat. You know, so he was a very, really hardworking guy. He was a farmer, rancher. And as most farmers and ranchers do, he worked a lot for good reason, because he's trying to make a living uh, raising animals and raising plants. But he was working a lot. He'd worked, been a rancher his whole life, multi-generational farming family. So he was used to working 60 or 70 hours a week. I said, you can't do it. I said, you can't do it because um, overwork stimulates the organs. Overwork stimulates our thoughts. Overwork stimulates the glands. It overstimulates the chi. So we cut down the work from 60 to 70 hours a week to about 35 hours a week. And I said, also, you got to sleep more. You can't be sleeping five to seven hours a night. You need more sleep. And so he agreed to sleep nine or 10, which he did. And the significance of that with cancer and with heat in general is that sleep cools us down, right? Sleep is relaxing. Sleep co cools down the energy, it cools down the organs, cools down the chi. So he went from 70, 60 to 70 hours a week to 35 to 40 hours a week, from five to seven hours of sleep to nine to 10 hours of sleep. Um, and he also didn't do that much acupuncture. He, he, only, he only needed to come in for two months. So two months of acupuncture. Um, for the first month, um, two treatments a week for one month. So a total of eight treatments in the first month. Not that much by a lot of standards. And then the second month, um, he came in once a week. So four treatments the second month, eight treatments the first month, a total of 12 treatments. And he also did a lot of really strong herbs. We do Western herbs and Chinese herbs. I'd love to use local Western herbs. Um, it is um, very possible to use the local Western herbs from a Chinese point of view, and I'd love to start a school um, to teach more about that at some point. But Chinese medicine um, has, has a very easy access with using Chinese herbs. Um, so we use a lot of Chinese herbs as well. So he's using very strong Chinese herbs to clear out heat. But at the same time that things were being cleared out of the body, we also used herbs to strengthen the body. So um, what were the results? Well, um, in two months, he was feeling much better. The night sweats had really gone away. The nodules had mostly gone away. His energy was back. He actually said to me that he hadn't felt this good in 30 years. Hadn't felt this good um, since he had left high school 30 years before. Um, he also lost 30 pounds, uh, not because he was on a restrictive diet. He was just cutting out things like sugar that can contribute to um, holding on to more weight than we need. Um, his 
wife came in at one treatment and said their marriage had never been better. It's a nice ancillary benefit, you know, rather than the collateral damage, we have ancillary benefits in Chinese medicine. Um, so he went back and got the Western tests. So what had happened? Uh, in eight weeks, his uh, white blood cell count had dropped from 40,000 to 10,800. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting because five years before, his white blood cell count had been 20,000. So in two months, they had dropped to 50% less than they were five years before. So in two months from when he came in, they had dropped about 75%, right? And he had all these ancillary benefits. So um, that is absolutely possible. That's not unique. And well, part of the story is um, he got the blood exam, got the blood tests, he brought him to our clinic, he invited his family in, and they came in the treatment room and they were crying. It's very sweet. It's a good story. Um, so that's the, that's the benefits of uh, waging peace. Not only can you treat significant symptoms, but you have all this other good stuff happens. He feels better. He loses weight. Not that we all need to lose weight, but he, you know, he, had, he had extra weight. Um, his marriage, according to his wife, had never been better. He felt really good in himself, and as a result, his white blood cell count dropped 75%. So it is very possible to wage peace, and a part of the way we wage peace is the food we eat. It's, and what you're talking about here and what Chinese medicine is talking about for thousands of years is very similar. Eat local stuff, eat natural stuff, um, eat unprocessed stuff, eat good tasting stuff, balanced, right? It's not a hamburger every night, but it's also not vegetables every night. You know, it's a balance of things, a diversity of things. Um, and the ancillary benefits of living that way, not only can serious symptoms go away, but we can feel better in who we are. Um, and I really believe that Chinese medicine fits very, very well to what you all are talking about here. Another significant issue that I have with the usual Western approach is that it's not participatory, right? I mean, we've had, I'm treating a number of people with cancer now, and they go to Western practitioners and they, and they ask about diet, for example. And the, a lot of the feedback is, well, it doesn't really matter. You can, really? No, I'm not, I'm not making that up. I had, a, I had a woman who just went down to Sloan Kettering in, in New York City, and we went, I spent an hour and a half with her the first time. And I didn't even do acupuncture, it was just for herbs. Talked about nutrition in real detail for what's needed, and she went to the excuse me, the folks in New York City at Sloan Kettering, and specifically asked, well, what do you think about nutrition? They said it doesn't matter. That's interesting. <laughs> so what we eat every day doesn't matter? Really? I mean, you don't have to have a PhD in nutrition or a master's degree in acupuncture to kind of get the idea that, well, maybe what I eat does affect me. And of course, we all know it does. Um, so um, I think what Chinese medicine has been talking about and what this conference is about in many ways is very, very similar. And it's very um, heartening for me to see that, to see the overlap of the old and the new. And a lot of it is really um, self-evident to me. Of course what we eat affects us. It affects us towards health and, and sickness. Um, so those are just, you know, I could talk a lot about case studies about things like this, but those are just some examples and I'm very um, honored to be invited here uh, to really um, add a little bit to the discussion from a Chinese medical point of view. So, <laughs> yeah. I have two questions. Um, can I ask both at once? Sure. Uh, the first is, can you talk about the difference between, uh, about the Chinese view of cooked versus raw food? Mm. Uh, because, you know, like in, in a lot of <clears throat> Western all the enzymes, and this is like, I've read Chinese say there's, there's a particular essence that comes out when you cook. Yeah. And yeah. my other question has to do with, okay, so overwork, lack of sleep, pathogens can cause heat. What else causes heat? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> that's um, um, potentially any, any imbalance in the body can create heat, can create inflammation. The most obvious things, and um, I'll just put this out there because I was asked, and I have a whole chapter in the book I'm writing. I'm, um, as Tree mentioned, I'm submitting the last chapters this month, and by this time next year, 
be published through North Atlantic Books, which is actually a publisher that started in Burlington, is now in Berkeley, um, uh, called The Yin and Yang of Climate Change, looking at climate change as a symptom and trying to understand the root cause. So I have a whole chapter um, dedicated to coffee, coffee and the connection between coffee and climate change. So uh, I know this is not always what people want to hear, but I feel necessary, I feel a, a desire and a need to say it, coffee causes inflammation. Coffee causes systemic inflammation throughout the body. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I get this. <laughs> but well, no one else is saying it, so I'll say it. So, so what, is, what is inflammation? Well, from a Western view, kind of more progressive um, Western medical understanding, is starting to, to recognize that inflammation can be connected to all disease, gastrointestinal disease, arthritic disease, everything. And Chinese medicine has a similar view. We can say that all imbalance eventually creates inflammation or creates heat. The, I would say the number one cause of inflammation in our country is the ingestion of coffee. Yeah. Sorry, we don't always get what we're looking for at conferences. What? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. You know why I would say that? I'll tell you why I would say that. that's a very good question. The reason I would say that is because we're already talking about sugar, right? We're already, we're already, many of us are already aware of the inflammatory properties of sugar. Very few people are talking about the severe inflammatory properties of coffee. In fact, I just did some research for the book. You can go online and, uh, let's see, um, Sloan Kettering, Harvard Medical School, WebMD, a lot of people are talking about the potential health benefits of coffee, right? But those health benefits, the, from the Chinese view, the health benefits are they promote circulation. It promotes the flow of blood. It increases blood flow to the brain. Those are way outweighed, in my opinion, um, in terms of the negative effects. So yes, I think coffee is very severe, obviously. Excuse me, sugar is very severe, obviously. But people are already talking about that. I would say because people are not talking about it, um, I would say coffee is a bigger thing. And it's so ubiquitous. Right, it's everywhere. What's that? Black tea is much better because it's, it's somewhat warming. Coffee is like blazing hot. Tea is, uh, black tea is warming. The best would be green tea. Because green tea, even though it has caffeine, it's actually cooling. So it can actually undo some of the effects of coffee. And now, uh, before I get to other questions, what was the second part? About, about um, cooked versus... Oh yeah, cooked all the time. <laughs> Pretty much. The, the Chinese, uh, a translation from Chinese medicine is we are, it's not, we are not what we eat, we are what we digest. So you can have the most beautiful meal, perfect in every way. If you can't assimilate it, it doesn't matter. You pass it out. So Chinese medicine heavily emphasizes cooking things. No, not everything. Salad in the summer and apples and berries and stuff. But most everything else because it's much easier to digest. And from a Western view, people will say, oh, you lose the enzymes. But if you couldn't digest those enzymes anyway then it doesn't matter. So the strong emphasis in Chinese medicine is on cooking things. And I have absolutely found that to be true. Now, I, I'll get to other folks, but did you have oh, one? No. OK. Yeah, David. Is that no, it's coffee. That's a really good question. It's coffee, because green tea, green tea has caffeine too. But green tea, because Chinese nutrition is interested in the nature of substances, what they're like. Now, coffee, excuse me, caffeine is stimulating. Um, which could imply that it's hot, but it's really the delivery system that's the issue. Coffee is hot, green tea is cooling. So you can get a bunch of caffeine from green tea and actually cool yourself down, which is why Asian culture, at least traditionally, is really into green tea and really not into coffee. If I did research on the historical discussion of coffee, and it was really talked about as early as the 1300s in Chinese nutrition, because Chinese nutrition has been talking about all kinds of stuff, like forever, you know, all kinds of weird things. Um, so it's literally written about thousands of different substances. So little was written about coffee, even though it was used, started to be used in the 1300s. And I think the reason for that is it wasn't considered useful. It had very little medicinal value. And a modern um, uh, Chinese practitioner, Bob Flaws, a very well-known scholar and writer, says that um, the only times that we should use coffee is when we would use speed. <laughs> really, like, so is there a medicinal use of speed? Yes. Not a very wide-ranging medicinal use, but you know, some kind of absolute collapse in the body, things like that. Um, so if, you're, if you don't think it's appropriate to use speed in an in 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 individual day or in your life, then coffee would, should be used similarly. 
We don't always get what we're looking for, but I really believe that to be true. Yeah. Yeah. How, what do you think, what's your take on the coffee enema? It works. Uh, it works. It clears things out. There's other ways to clear things out. Um, I think the way coffee works as a laxative from the Chinese view is it irritates the intestines. And so when the intestines are irritated, they evacuate. So that can be a good thing. Um, the issue with the coffee enema is that irritation, even though it can create a, a, a bowel movement, that can actually contribute to heat. Right? So my experience is that there's other ways to flush out the bowels that don't contribute to the heat. I think it, I think it has a medicinal use. I think there's other ones that I, I use more frequently. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, you said you spoke with that man about eliminating sugar. Would that yeah. include natural sugars such as maple syrup, honey, and also fruits? For him, it did. In general, no. No, it's... Um, um, sugar by its nature is warming. Um, processed sugar takes the warming to a totally different degree. It goes to hot. So for him it did because he had a lot of heat, um, as indicated by being right in the verge of leukemia. So him it was all sugar. But um, um, sweet is not a bad taste. Processed sugar is really the issue. So you know, maple syrup and fruit and um, honey, those are all fine in moderation. But if you have an extreme heat condition, I almost always uh, you know, request that people don't ingest them, at least until the heat is down. And then, and then the diet can change. OK, yeah? What are the other ways that you would evaluate the bowels without doing the Oh, there's a lot of great herbs for that. Yeah. And, Oh yeah, the, the, um, what are other ways to evacuate the bowels? Um, there's lots of different um, ways to do that with, with Western and Chinese herbs, um, depending on how you want to do it. Um, rhubarb root, um, called da huang in Chinese medicine, you can use Western or Chinese rhubarb root. Those, that's very harsh, and that will work. There's other less harsh um, herbs. Um, actually, well-known one in Chinese herbalism is actually um, cannabis seed not the other stuff, the seed. Um, you can also use um, uh, yellow dock root, for example. But leafy green vegetables will soften the stools, too. So it depends on what your, how severe things need to be. And when you're uh, with the fruit, should you always cook the fruit as well? No, you can generally eat fruit raw, yeah, seasonal. That's one of the, uh, I would say fruit and leafy green vegetable salad stuff. Yeah, but most everything else. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating a fresh carrot, either. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that if something isn't cooked, it's much harder to digest. It's harder on the digestive system. Even if you feel good, we want to absorb as much of the nutrients as possible. So it's not a complete exclusion of raw stuff. But Chinese nutrition is very clear historically, because a lot of things have been tried in Chinese nutrition and in Chinese medicine. And the clear, I would say, consensus historically is that cooked food is really beneficial. Yeah, I'm just gonna get to, and I'll come back to that. Yeah. Have you had experience as a I have. Yeah. Um, yes. The question was, have have we had experience treating Lyme disease? And I'm not um, here to toot my own horn, but I guess I'll toot it a little bit. Um, it's very treatable. It's absolutely treatable. The way we treat it is by waging peace. Um, waging peace. Yeah. Really. Um, the, in Chinese medicine, we're trying to treat the individual first and the condition second. So I've had very good results. I've had many um, positive results. Not, not only positive results, but people really getting completely better um, from it. The, the um, issue is who is the person, what's their internal condition like, and how has Lyme affected them? I've had people who really hadn't recovered all the way from Lyme who are fully recovered, and I'm working with people who um, you know, we're on very severe um, Western um, treatments. I was treating a woman who was on an IV drip um, cocktail of antibiotics for over a year and a half every day. Um, when she came in to see us, she could barely walk, uh, really, barely walk. She's having severe um, neurological conditions. Um, she's not all the way better, but she's working three days a week. So that's going to take longer. Um, I've had a number of people who were, you know, maybe 50 to 70 percent over the line when they came in, and they're at more than 100 percent. They feel better now than the, than before the issue. So the treatment is different depending on. It's not. It's, 
No. It's different. Real, that's a really good example. <clears throat> you know, from, um, we're not using the equivalent of herbal antibiotics. And that's a major focus now. And there's books written about it, right? Rather than using this antibiotic, use this herb. Rather than using this herbal antibiotic cocktail, use these herbs. That's not our approach. Um, and the reason for that is the herbal antibiotics or the pharmaceutical antibiotics <clears throat> are treating part of the picture, which is the inflammation. But the inflammation with Lyme in particular is really only part of the condition. It's not all of it. So we do treat the inflammation, but we treat a lot of other things that go along with it. Part of it we treat is people's energy, people's strength and people's well-being. When people have been on antibiotics, almost everyone that we've seen has been on antibiotics for at least six months. Um, people have been on for two or three years. Part of what you need to do is strengthen them. You, the warfare has been going on long enough. We need to wage peace, clear things out, and bring in their strength, bring in their vitality. Okay, she's very kindly holding a sign. I'd love to continue the conversation, and um, thank you for having me.